All right, so to get started this week, we're going to talk about competition. This is chapter 14 in your ecology book. And one of the first examples are pitcher plants and how they compete with one another for space, um, which is one of the, the reasons that we think that they've gone to um, the adaptation of eating insects, is that it allows them to compete um, better with each other in an intraspecific competition for space. So competition is a non-trophic interaction for the most part. You're not eating each other, you're pushing each other out of place, you're competing for the same resources. And what's interesting about competition is if you look at both species, they're both negatively affected. So most interactions um, we study in ecology are plus minus interactions, things like herbivory, predation, parasitism, where one organism is benefited and the other is harmed, but in competition, both organisms are harmed. And this is an important point, um, you know, a lot of people who study economics, you know, and they think that our, our systems of um, economics are better because of healthy competition, you know, among businesses. It's actually, you know, like potentially not true that any kind of competition harms um, both, both groups um, or both, both partners in the relationship. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind throughout. So we can talk about interspecific competition, which is um, competition between members of different species. We can also talk about intraspecific competition, which is um, competition between individuals of the same species. We've already talked about this a little bit, um, not necessarily in terms of competition, but in terms of density dependent growth. So the logistic model, you see populations slow down when there's a lot of members of that population because resources get scarce. So that's, a, that's an example of intraspecific competition. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how, um, how competition is mainly about resources. So the resources that um, organisms compete for are things like food, water, light, and space. Um, and so those are the things that you usually see organisms compete for. Um, we're gonna talk about two things. One is called the fundamental niche and the other is called the realized niche. Um, the fundamental niche is the Sorry, this is a better picture. The fundamental niche is the food resources, water and light that are required by the species. So you can look in this case, it's maybe thinking about this um, space of resources and two different resources. Maybe it's light and space that a species needs. And the fundamental niche would be the full set of resources that species would use were they all available. The realized niche is um, kind of the restricted set of resources that a species is limited to. And so in this case, you can see all around that fundamental niche for species one, you have these other species coming in and competing with subsets of those resources. And so the realized niche for species one is much smaller. It's just that inside kind of outline of blue. That's what it can, um, it can get to easily without competition. You may still have access to those resources out in the the kind of uh, Venn diagram spaces, but then it's gonna be competing with other species for those things. So there are a few different types of competition. Um, species can compete either directly or indirectly. And indirect competition is um, called exploitation competition, where individuals are basically just reducing the supply of a resource. So in my household, uh, we all love Cheez-Its and if um, somebody else gets to the Cheez-Its before you do, then they've reduced the supply of Cheez-Its, and so that would be exploitation competition. Um, the example of that is pitcher plants taking up space. Um, direct competition doesn't happen so much in my household over Cheez-Its. That's when one species kind of pushes the other one out of the way and like fights them for their Cheez-Its. Like, well, we don't take it that far. And that would be called interference competition where we have um, carnivores fighting over prey or barnacles like physically pushing each other out of space, plants maybe shading each other out. Um, and then the last kind of competition is, um, is called allelopathy, but it's really hard to prove. So it's a chemical competition that can be used between plants. So if you have one plant um, putting out defensive compounds that keep other plants from, um, from taking up that space. So here's an example of kudzu. This would be um, kind of that, uh, uh, well, it could, it could be considered both interference competition where you're actually pushing plants out of space, shading each other's, 
um, shading each other out and moving, um, basically taking up the space so that other plants can't can get it. All right, so um, what's interesting about competition is that it has this negative negative effect. So if you look at species one and species two, they're both being harmed, but there's kind of a continuum between what's called amensalism to competition and amensalism is kind of a zero to one um, relationship. So one, one species being harmed, um, or I guess a zero to minus is, is a better way to explain it. So one species is harmed where the other species is neutrally in fact, impact, impact, not really impacted. So on, on either end of the spectrum or this continuum, you can have an amensal situation and then approaching the middle where you have strict competition where they're both being harmed. So we can have um, what's called competitive exclusion, um, which it means that two species start competing, a dominant species pushes the inferior species out. Um, and this happens when two species are using a limiting resources, resource and they use it in a really similar way so they cannot coexist. Um, that is kind of shown here in figure D where you have two species of paramecium coming together, they're both growing at the beginning and then um, P. aurelia continues to grow in kind of a logistic model, but then you see the P. caudatum goes to extinction basically. So that would be competitive exclusion. Um, competitive coexistence would be something more like shown in E where you see both species increase and they both hit a carrying capacity that's, um, that's at a different level. And so they're both, they're both coexisting even though they're competing and their carrying capacities may have been lowered. Um, compared to where they would grow on their own. So competitive coexistence, most of the time you see some sort of competitive coexistence. And so organisms will adapt, they'll start sharing resources or partitioning resources. So you can use limited resource in different ways, that's resource partitioning. Um, you can start to forage in different parts of the canopy if you're a bird. Um, you can start to forage on different sizes of seeds. Um, what we see in this kind of classic case is what's called character displacement, where competition alters the phenotype of the competing species over time. And so on two different islands on the bottom, Los Hermanos and Daphne Island, you can see that both species, G. fortis and G. folignosa, have about the same size beaks. But when you put them together on the same islands, like Pinta and Marchena, you can see that they separate and that they they basically that um, G. fortis beak size gets larger, G. fuliginosus beak size has gotten smaller, and this has happened over many generations of evolutionary time. That the competitive, um, the competition between the birds has kind of forced them apart and caused them to change phenotypically. So the lock of Volterra competition model is a modification of the logistic equation. So here you can see. Um, one version of the logistic equation, and um, n is the population size, r is the intrinsic rate of increase, and k is the carrying capacity. And basically what you do is you add um, a term to, um, you create two of these models, one for each species, if you're looking at a two species competition system, and you add a term in the first model, um, the alpha term times n2 is a function of um, how large the second species population is times a competition coefficient for that species. And the same is true for species two. You can see there's this additional term plus beta times n1. And so now these two population sizes for each population are dependent on both competition coefficient and its strength and the population size of the other population. And my chalk talk goes into a lot more detail. So please watch those, um, those videos. The last one also shows you some hints for how to get through some of the homework questions. So the lock of Volterra competition models, if you set DNDT equal to zero and you solve for the, um, the equilibrium, then, um, then you can start to predict population sizes um, and you can um, and you can figure out what um, how population might change um, as, as the carrying capacities change or as alpha or beta change. 
So again, be sure to watch those chalk talks so that uh, I'm just giving you some, um, some hint, not some hints here, but I'm just explaining um, the start of it. And then I go into a lot more detail in those other talks. It's just easier than doing it on the slides. So a couple um, kind of classic examples of competitive exclusion or competition have to do with barnacles. And so this is something that was, um, was really figured out just down the road um, in the Pacific Northwest. We have two species of, um, of barnacles. And what we found when we removed one or the other is that there's this zone of competition between the two. And that, um, that the semibalanus species is a more competitive um, species. It's more aggressive and it can push the thalamus um, species out. But the thalamus species is more um, resistant to drought. And so when, when you have high tide and drying down, or sorry, when you have low tide, um, the, the thalamus species can, out, can kind of outcompete the, um, the more aggressive semibalanus because it has a more tolerance to that environmental condition. So really competition is neat because it brings into play lots of abiotic factors that can influence populations, but also lots of biotic factors mutualism so, and things like that. And then the last example from the book talks about chipmunk resource partitioning and how you have um, different species of chipmunks that take over different mountains. And um, here you can see one species, Tamias quadra vitatus, in the Oregon Mountains, and a different species, Tamias dorsalis, is dominant in the Magdalena Mountains. And you can see that they both take up that whole region of the mountain um, when they're in isolation, but you bring them together to one mountain that has both species, Mount Taylor, you can see that they're partitioning the resources on the mountain. There's basically these zones where you find one species and then the other. So they're not, they're not mixing and sharing and, and basically um, dealing with, uh, with uh, ex exploitation competition, but they're, they're basically trying to keep their populations separate and doing more resource partitioning. Okay, so. Hopefully that's a good introduction to competition and the mathematics of it, um, I'll explain in further lectures.